Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an adult improver, or is it a senior sustainer edition of Perpetual Chess? We will discuss that in a minute. And I am joined, actually, by a guest co-host, a friend of the pod, and a guest. And I will introduce them both in a minute, but I just wanted to go over one or two things before that. One of them is a friend and listener of the pod who shall remain anonymous Ask me, what do I mean when I say something's in the show notes? So I wanted to quickly address that for any anyone else who uh, is not um, an avid podcast listener and maybe doesn't know when me or any other podcast host says that. Basically, what that means is if you read the description of a given podcast, you'll find lots more details, often links to things that we reference. And different podcast feeds, like if you listen on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or whatever it may be, they have different restrictions about what you can put in the notes. So sometimes on like Apple Podcasts, it'll cut off in the middle. And that's not my doing, that's their doing. So I do my best to have like lots of details right in the show notes, some other podcasts like like Tim Ferriss for example he puts his show notes on his webpage people do it differently for me it's all I try to put it in the show notes but if it's not there it's always on the webpage if you go to perpetualchesspod.com and then go to that episode that's where anything where you see me mention like Arthur Yusupov and you're like who's Arthur Yusupov and then you can go and look up or if there's a chess game referenced Um, I try to track all that stuff down for you guys uh, as best I can. So that's what we mean when we say there's a link in the show notes. Uh, The other thing I wanted to mention was on the last Adult Improver pod, I had solicited volunteers to uh, come talk about their uh, chess experience from fellow amateurs. And actually, our guest this week is one of the people who answered that call. Um, But I also I wanted to encourage people to keep doing that. But the other thing I wanted to say is so I used a link in the show notes for that um for that call and it's really helpful if you use that link instead of emailing me because then if i'm thinking about addressing a certain theme in an adult improver episode um, i can just go to one place it feeds into a google form and then i can just go through the list and obviously it's a lot of people i can't reply to all of the emails but that way i can just go to the list and look So I'm really happy to get as many people volunteering or suggesting friends of theirs or their coaches or whatever it may be as as you all want. But uh, it is best to use the link in the show notes when you do that. So with those two announcements out of the way, let's introduce our our guest co-host, who longtime listeners of the podcast will be familiar with. Um, He is a Chess Steps trainer and a chessable author of six courses. He is a new in chess author. He often writes about national champions for them. He is also a chess dad. His daughter, Lisa, won the silver and bronze at the girls' World Youth Championships. She also won the Women's Dutch Championship at age 19 with a performance rating of 2558. His his daughter Donna was also a champion. She was the first girl to win the Youth Championships in the Netherlands ahead of Robin Van Kampen and many other current GMs. So just remarkable achievements by by his daughters. Um, And he's an excellent trainer and I've collaborated with him before and uh, you guys can hear our full interview um, in episode 142 from 2019, if you have not heard that already. Uh, so before we introduce our guest, let's welcome Han Shu back to Perpetual Chess. Welcome, Han. Thank you, Ben. And uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. It's good to be back. Um, I was in episode 142 in 2019. I still get questions about the Chess Steps method based on that podcast. So it says something about the popularity of your podcast. Congratulations. Also, thank you for selecting one of my courses, the Dubov Explosive Italian is one of your favorite chessable courses. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So recently there was a sale on Chessable and they asked me to pick some of my favorite courses. And Han is one I was familiar with. Uh, Dubov's Explosive Italian is a fun line. And as someone who hasn't been playing E4 as much lately, but a lifetime E4 player, I was always looking for something offbeat because the, the Roy and the Spanish, they, you know, 
I mean, the the Roy and the Italian, they they just get repetitive, and the Scotch isn't that good. Let's be real. <laughs> uh, Han found something that uh, Han found found a nice opening that is pretty offbeat. So I recommend, and he did a great job on the course. So I recommend listeners check that out. And we have questions from listeners for both our guest and Han. But without further ado, we need to introduce our guest. So. Our guest is named Paul Hedrick, and he is a New Mexico-based teacher. And contra a lot of the people who emailed me recently about potentially being adult improver guests, um, our guest Paul said he has no interest in getting better at chess, um, <laughs> or at least his primary his primary goal is sustainment. And funny enough, for listeners who heard my recent podcast. Uh, discussing the mammoth book of the world's greatest chess games with Christopher Chabri, guest co-hosting, and uh, Graham Burgess joined us. There was a question from longtime listener in front of the pod, Tyron Ross Price, calling himself a senior sustainer. And I had just recently before that received that email from Paul. So I felt like it was fate. And I felt like I'm overdue to sort of, you know, talk about themes different than just like, uh, you know, 20 something dude who's gained 600 points or whatever it might be uh, recently. So I'm excited to get a different perspective and to finally welcome Paul to the show. Welcome. Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks. And sorry, Paul, I'm not used to giving like six minutes soliloquies at the beginning of the <laughs> show, but, uh, but I'm uh, quite, quite happy to have you. So, um, so let's get into it, Paul. So I, you know, Han and I were chatting about this interview before uh, we we joined you. And we were saying that to us, it feels like there's a fundamental tension because I don't think it's that unusual that you've decided your your goal is not not necessarily to get better at chess. I've mentioned before, I think that's admirable. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people come to that conclusion. But I think what was different to me is that you're still listening to a podcast about chess improvement. So could you square that circle for us? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I, I love, I love the stuff of chess. You know, I love the, um, you know, I love chess books. I love chess games. I love the, uh, the, uh, the broadcast chess tournaments and, uh, you know, the, like, um, the, the big matches and, uh, and your podcast is just, it's, it's, part of the the chess landscape uh for me and so uh i'm i'm happy to hear what other people are doing uh, and i'm uh, like i love the the book recaps that you have on here uh and it's uh, it's not that that sort of thing isn't study per se right it's uh uh it, it doesn't lead to uh any kind of rating gain but it's it, it's all part of this uh this this world that i i i really like a lot so that's where that's coming from well i i appreciate that you that you appreciate chess culture because in doing this podcast, I've come to realize that, you know, I think as as you spend more time with chess, often you come to appreciate that. But when when someone's new to the game, what they love the most is the game, you know, and they want to get better at the game, which I, which I also understand that perspective. Um, and by the way, I wanted to read what Paul wrote when when he volunteered, which was one quote was, however, my goal is no longer improvement or rating increases. I'm now aiming for nothing more than maintenance. I'll be content if I can win or draw the occasional game, lose without glaringly obvious blunders, and above all, maintain my interest in chess as a rewarding pastime. So, I, you know, I loved reading that, but what, what, uh, what compelled you to volunteer, given that we are often improvement oriented here on these particular episodes? Well, I uh, so I, I I've been listening to the podcast for uh, for several months, and um, every time you, uh, an adult improver comes on, there's there's always sort of a, a disconnect uh, between. Uh, my, where I am right now as an almost 60 year old man, right, uh, who's just getting back into this and just trying to kind of dabble and do what I can. And these and uh, the many of the adult improvers who come on, like, uh, I think it was, uh, you had a, a, a gentleman on uh, maybe last week, who's like, he has this very, this very ambitious study program with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like, years long, this year, I'm doing tactics, this year, I'm doing, and, uh, and, Bruce, right, exa one, yeah, one and exactly, only, yeah. right. And so when, when you put out the, uh, when you put out the, the, the cattle call, um, I was, um, uh, 
I, uh, I started initially to, to, to write and say, I would love to hear this sort of guest, a guest that, uh, that is in my position. Um, and then that, that sort of morphed into, well, I, I guess I'm asking for this sort of guest, or maybe I'm volunteering. I'm not really sure. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, I, I guess, a, 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 a desire on my part to, uh, to, I don't know, hear what somebody, uh, to hear if there's anybody else in my, in my position and, uh, right now as someone who's, uh, just, you know, coming back to the game and, uh, and no longer has the ambition that I did say when I was, you know, uh, you know, 28. Uh, so that's where I was coming from. So Paul, yes. So I have a question about the why, right? Yeah. The why, why you play chess and let me give you my spectrum, right? So I live in Florida and there are a lot of seniors who play here in the libraries. They're not concerned about rating. They like to the trash talk. They like to talk some <laughs> politics. And they just like to have a good time together, right? As if they are on the golf, co uh, golf course, but then it's chess. On the other hand, when I interview my national champions, of course, they, are, they like to travel. They like to meet, be in different cultures. They, they, they like to meet different people, make new friends. Right. So what is it for you that, that you say that that is why I like to play chess? So it's absolutely. And, and this is true going all the way back to uh, when I first uh, when I first picked up chess. It's always been the people for me. Uh, this is what I, I, I have. A, I have a real difficult time with um, with online chess because there's no presence there right there's no yeah. there's no personality i don't get a, a a sense of my uh my opponent and chess has always been the most rewarding for me when i am part of a group like uh the the this uh this group of seniors that that you're describing right now they remind me a lot of the guys that i've just started playing with over the last few months um they many of them they as far as i know they don't even know the names of openings they would have no idea who magnus carlson is for example yes. um they have no interest in in uh writing their games down or going back over them later. They just you know, sit down, they play some chess when it's over, flip around the board, off they go again. Right. And uh, it's, uh, and, and, uh, but it's just the fact that they, I, I'm getting to know these guys. They're all, they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're fun. They, we have this one thing in common. Uh, they really, really want to beat me. Uh, and uh, it, <laughs> it, it, it uh, just that, that, that personal presence, right? Having that, you know, a face on the other side of a real board kind of, yes. it kind of brings that, that, uh, I don't know, the, the intensity of the, the game experience to a certain level that I, that I enjoy. If, if I didn't have any people around, I, I, I would not be able to play this game, honestly. I just, uh, I'm not an online chess kind of person. Hmm. But, it seems like your interest is a little bit deeper than the people you describe. Again, getting back to sort of your your following high level chess, and you know, I know you've got an affinity for chess literature. Um, and by the way, I should have I should have mentioned that Paul's peak rating was in the low thirteen hundreds, and you you stopped your last tournament was in two thousand nine. And you also mentioned in one of your messages, um, you you don't really have any interest in tournaments going forward. Uh, can you confirm or deny yeah, no, that? That is that is true. I've uh, yeah, I have uh, I, I've decided I just have no business in in uh, uh, tournaments at all. Uh, I'm um, as low as my rating is. I, I my level of play, I'm sure, is miles below that, and so it would be. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I, my my ego would not be able to uh, withstand watching that sort of you know de uh, spiraling descent down into the uh, you know the the three digits. So that's the, I do. I am <laughs> confirming that. Yes. But well, what makes you think that that your play has uh, deteriorated? Oh uh, well, I so I'm I, I am I playing uh, a couple times a week as part of my job, I, I sponsor a chess club, uh, over at, uh, uh at, at my school. Uh, and, um, I can, I, I can tell just by the, by the frequency of my, oh, I mean, just, just uh, horrible mistakes when I'm playing these kids that, uh, that I'm, 
uh, you know, some of these kids are, I think the highest rated kid is, is 1200. And, uh, I think the lowest rated is 700. And, uh, it, I think any of those kids can beat me on a given day. Uh, uh, so just just based on based on that, I would say my my rating is much much lower than uh, than the low thirteen hundreds uh, from you know, a decade ago. And and Han, feel free to hop in whenever yeah. whenever you have a question. But when when you did play tournaments, we we chatted about it a little bit. Uh, when we talked last week, uh, did you generally enjoy it, Paul? I did. I mean, it's uh, it, it's a uh, it's a mixed bag, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, it it certainly is uh, a, uh, a a a rewarding experience. Say, playing in a in a five round weekend tournament with a nice long, uh, a nice slow time control. Um, but it's also exhausting. And um, I think we may have chatted about this once or eventually maybe two, three, four or five times in the course of a weekend, I you know, would find myself scratching my head thinking, why on earth am I doing my, this <laughs> to myself? <laughs> I could be some, doing something much, uh, m- much more relaxing. Uh, but it's very addictive. I mean, right, even now, even having decided, okay, this is my tournament days are over, I find myself sort of trying to live vicariously through uh, the people I know th- uh, who are still playing in tournaments. Uh, one of the seniors that I play with, he's uh, he's uh, 1900 rated uh, player, and uh, I'll always ask him. I think, as far as I know, he's the only rated player in this group. Uh, you know, ask him when he's going to play in the next one. I have a good friend that uh, we play with once a month, and I'll you know kind of I'll bother him. All right, what tournament are you getting ready for? And even yeah. the students, I, I do it. It's it's embarrassing. I uh, you know, hey, have you seen this uh, this tournament? Uh, you know, you should really play in this, and then tell me all about it. So I. I don't have to do it. Uh, so <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, I, I still feel the call for sure. Um, yeah, I, Han, you, you've mentioned, you've mentioned stuff like that too, right? Han, how often, like, and I feel this way too, like a fellow amateur player who, you know, is playing actively you're you can often be as eager to see how they did as you, as you yeah. might like, you know, what's going on in Vikanzi or whatever it might be. Of course. Yes. So, you said the company is very important, right? The, 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 the meeting face to face and just having a good time together. But if, and then, if you look to the chess activity yourself, is it for you uh, like a intellectual challenge, or how do you approach the game itself? So that's uh, I always like having a project uh, going at any given time, and I think this is just maybe stems from my my uh job teaching especially at the beginning of the year is 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 just a it's a big project that in, requires a lot of preparation and a lot of walk around thinking about it all the time and it's it's uh it's something to the, that i'll work on daily so um I like to have a another project that uh, that is just for fun. That's just for me. Uh, maybe fun is the wrong word. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. You know, playing through end games at five o'clock in the morning uh, over my cup of coffee <laughs> is actually fun. But uh, it's uh, it, it it it's something that keep me occupied, keep me mentally uh, engaged, um, the same way mm-hmm. that my my work does. Um, it's uh, if. Uh, honestly, if I uh, if if I'm if I'm not doing something like that, like playing through these positions every morning, I just get bored. I don't know what to do with myself. So it's a it's something to keep me uh, to 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 keep my mind occupied, right? Give me something to yeah. to work uh, mentally mentally engaged. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so so you write also what you're doing, right? So the the first thing was like playing people in real life over the board. The second thing was basic tactics and end games. Um, then you are reviewing master games, and that fits also in this picture that you're portraying of this chess landscape being a, a literature and history teacher. So I can appreciate what you that it fits into that. Some openings and some planning you you mention rarely. A little. Uh, so you, can you can you expand on basically your chess activity? Oh uh, sure. My, the the master games thing. Oh, I have the book right here. Is a it's a a, a little 
uh, well, I described it as idiosyncratic. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm very interested in uh, master games played during a certain period from uh, 1966 to 1972. And so I have kind of a best of, uh, best of list from the, from that period. I'm, so, I'm just yeah. right now working my way through them. Um, I have them written down on a little card and I, uh, I try to memorize the game first um, just to, uh, actually, I'm not really sure why, <laughs> why I memorize it, uh, but it's a uh, it's a challenge. It's 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 hard to do. I um, in in a way, memorizing a game almost is like building uh, muscle memory is the only analogy I can think of it. I'm like I'm playing right now through a, a Larson Petrosian game from uh, this tournament from San right, Santa yeah. Monica, 1966. And, the second Pierre Gorski Cup. Um, exactly. Yeah. And this is a wonderful book. I love this book. Um, and uh, who's who's the author for listeners? Who I, uh, it's are. the uh, it's edited by Isaac Kajdan and uh, it's okay. a Dover book. And um, the one thing that I would warn your listeners against is at least the version uh, I, I know have. Where this is going. Yeah, it's, I know it's where in this the is dreadful going. descriptive <laughs> notation. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> and and wow, I, I, I that would be wonderful if Dover had re uh, has re released this in algebraic because this is uh, this, I think this is what put me off chess when I was you know like six. Descriptive notation just makes no sense to me. But uh, it um, so it's. Uh, you know, I, I I I try to understand the the moves of both sides, right? Win or lose, and um, and then I go from there, and I'll, I'll I'll look at the openings. I'll see what the state of those openings are. Like for example, it's a it's a Sicilian dragon uh, that Larson and Petrosian are playing in this game that I'm going over, and um, and to see uh, see what that what the opening looks like in the 21st century, and and then just laboriously work my way through the notes until I, until really I've just had enough of it. Uh, it's, um, I have no particular goal in mind. Again, this is just something that, uh, to, to keep me, uh, immersed in chess stuff. In this case, history, in this case, a good book, um, for the readers. Again, I'd say, I really recommend this book because, uh, in most of the games in this, in this tournament book, the editor asked both players to annotate the game. And, uh, uh -huh. and so you'll get very different, uh, viewpoints on, on the same position from both players. And they wrote them in, uh, independently. So just as a, from a, from a, uh, from a, literary point of standpoint it's it's kind of it's unique in uh in in chess literature i think but anyway but i digress yeah and it's a legendary tournament i mean petrosian was the sitting world champion and you have the next two world champions playing in it in in spassky and fisher um because i i had to look it up when you when you mentioned the email uh that that you were interested from Santa Monica, 1966, to, was it Texas? San, San, San Antonio, 1972. <laughs> yeah. so, I, was like, I was like, those are very specific. <laughs> yeah, and San Antonio, 1972, that's, uh, that's a, an RHM uh, book, again, in uh, descriptive notation. And that one is just, that's an odd tournament. Uh, Petrosian is in it again. Uh, Fisher is now world champion. Uh, and Karpov is uh, plays in it, a young Karpov, and of course he's a new up and comer, and uh, and he uh, destroys everybody. Um, there's a um, you guys, do you, you guys remember Chess Digest, the um, the the uh, distributor out of Dallas? Uh, either of yes. you familiar with that? So K Ken Smith was the guy who uh, yeah. owned Chess Digest uh, and, of the Smith Moore Gambit. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and he. He actually plays in this tournament. Um, doesn't do particularly well, but it's just it's a it's a unique tournament, and to me, it covers the 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 period of, of chess that I'm most interested in. That sort of age of Fisher, because that's what got me. Uh, that's what I recall. Well, as you both know now, but from reading my story, mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, that's what really got me hooked on chess. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, that the fact that there's this guy on the news who um, is playing chess somewhere far away, and I knew what chess was as a little kid. Um, so it's that time period that I'm most fascinated with. And let, let me ask you, Paul, so you described 
uh, sort of atrophying in your chess game. I hope you don't consider that like too too harsh a term. It's <laughs> um, a kind term, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and you obviously exude enthusiasm for chess still. Um, and when you did play your last tournament, you know your rating was a, was at its peak um, at that time. So at least most of the people who typically listen to the adult improver episodes, they might say, well, you know, I'm a little rusty, you know, I'm, I'm making more blunders than I would like. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get to work on that. I'm going to, you know, do an hour of tactics a day and, and see if that helps. Um, so is, does that just sound unappealing to you or you just don't care enough or, I mean, and again, well, there's no judgment. I, no, I no, no. hearing your enthusiasm, but I'm just curious. It, uh, when I first uh, really started studying chess, uh, it was in my late 20s. Uh, and again, it was Bobby Fischer's fault. Uh, Fischer's Spassky 2 uh, started and I was like, oh my God, Fischer is back. I have to learn chess so I can follow these games. Um, I, uh, I started uh, a years long study program. I mean, I got I, I, anything I could grab, get my hands on, I would try to read. Um, I, I, every study program that I could find, I would pay attention to it. And okay, I have to read this book now, and I have to do this and learn these. And so, and I did that for for years. And I just found, you know, much to my shock, uh, that really I'm just not that good at chess. Uh, as much as I love it, I'm just not a, a very strong player. I don't have the, you know, whatever that, uh, you know, the, the, that, that quality. I don't have the, I don't have any kind of the, the necessary chess talent that would get me to, you know, 1800 and above as the, as the study plans always say, I'm like, oh, here I come. No, nope, it wasn't, it wasn't to happen. So I, I just feel like I've done it all, right? I feel like I've, uh, like in those years, I, uh, I, I, I tried everything and, um, yeah, I mean, I got, a, I got a little better, but, um, after a while, I sort of hit this point of diminishing returns, right? Where the amount of work that you're putting into a study program is not producing, uh, you know, returns and as far as rating points go. So, uh, uh what I'm trying to do right now is just kind of tr- find a, a middle ground between, you know, I'll do, do a little bit of work so I don't get, you know, I don't forget how the pieces move. Um, but, uh, I, I also don't want to put in so much work that it, you know, when, that it makes me, uh, miserable when I'm not seeing myself, uh, you know, suddenly become an expert, right? Yeah. When you, when you uh, play your games, your casual games, do you still yeah. notate them? Do I do. Do you still I record do. them? Yeah, I actually. Do you, do you evaluate your games or not? Uh, oh, he's holding up a scorebook. Yeah, I actually, I, 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 yeah. Bought the, I bought a, a scorebook just for yeah. the occasion. My, my last scorebook that I found I had filled up, I bought in uh, 1993. So I thought, okay, it's mm. time to buy a new one. Um, I uh, I go through. I'll I'll put them into the uh, into one of the online engines and just sort of play through it. I don't really have anybody to analyze with. Like these, uh, you know, I only see these guys once a week, and like I said, they just they just want to play. Um, so I'll I'll put them through the engines and uh, and 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 uh, pay attention to uh, to what the, what the engine suggests. I'll try to find a balance between, well, the engine is suggesting that and I would never make that move in a million years, but what would I do? What does seem like a logical move to me? Uh, and, and sort of approach computer analysis that way. Um, uh, of course, some days I'm just, uh, you know, really what I'm just trying to do is make sure that this stuff, that the chess notation is actually correct. That's, uh, that's sometimes, yeah. uh, that's, that's sometimes the battle. Uh, it's like, wait, that the, the knight cannot move that way. And, uh, yeah, just to actually, uh, remember where all the squares are. So, uh, my, my, my goals are sometimes quite low. Okay. Well, well, Paul, I, We've got to take a break soon, but I want to dive into one listener question. We've got some good ones for you. And this one is uh, related to what you were just uh, just touching on. So I figured now is a good time to ask. So this one is from Thomas Optikul. Uh Thomas, I hope I said that right. Uh, thanks for supporting the podcast via Patreon, Thomas. And Thomas wrote in and asked, he said, 
As a 40-year-old father of three rated around 1,200 ELO, I feel I, I'll have to be realistic about what I can achieve in chess as well. I'm curious if Paul can recall the moment when he altered his mindset from how to improve to how to still enjoy chess while recognizing that serious improvement is not probable. Was this shift uh, of mindset a conscious effort or rather a slow development? Yeah, that was a great question. Uh, the uh, I w- My answer to that is both. Um, there was a moment... 10 years ago or so when I, I was I briefly got back into tournament play and I, I realized I think this is as good as I'm going to get and then I stopped playing uh, and uh, the 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 slow part was coming back to it now you know in uh, in my late 50s and thinking okay well this is still, this is obviously still a part of my experience. This is still something that I I value. What do I do? Uh, you know, uh, there, there's got to be a way that I can I can make this work. That I can still uh, make this a part of my life without you know being so uh, without fretting over rating points and tournament results. So uh, it was an initial realization followed by kind of a a, a long slow realization. But again, you did stop at your peak. So, what made you think this was as good as you were, you would get? Uh, well, I mean, it was. Uh, I played in a. Uh, um, I I played in a quad uh, against um, uh, against uh, you know three other players about my same rating. This is when I was living up in Santa Fe, and I had really been seeing. Uh, since I'd come back, uh, it had been another 10 years before then that I hadn't played. I was, re- I was, boy, I was playing just the games of my life and I played in that quad and I just, uh, there was, there was something about it. My, my performance in that quad that just made me, that, that led me to that conclusion. It's like, this is as good as I get. Um, <laughs> Okay. Well, um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I just want to be clear for, for listeners. It's, I, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing Paul's perspective, but I want to be clear that I do think Paul can get better at chess, <laughs> but I fully support his decision. You don't have to want to get better at chess. There's no, you know, th- that's totally valid. Chess is a beautiful game that I think lots of people, um, you know, could, could take a possibly healthier approach of just appreciating the game and not obsessing over rating points. So all in all, I think it's admirable, even though I do think that, <laughs> that you you didn't necessarily achieve your best, Paul. Well, all right. <laughs> Good. To, see, you shouldn't tell me this, Ben, because now that's going to stick in my <laughs> oh, yeah. brain. And yeah, uh, wait, hmm, yeah let's see. What's, to, yeah, what's you're gonna, what what, ter- you're gonna what tournament is coming up next? <laughs> Yeah, I'll get an angry email after you lost to a five-year-old. That's right. (laughs) Damn you, Ben Johnson. (laughs) All right. Well, we are overdue for a break, but we've got some great listener questions to continue to dive into. So we will be back in a minute. Listeners, I just got an update from aimchess.com, and unfortunately, I'm still behind on the clock 72% of the time. Working to get better, progress is not just a straight line upward, but I am getting better in the other aspects of your game, which Aim Chess can measure, which are openings, tactics, endings, advantage capitalization, and resourcefulness. And of course, Aim Chess automatically gathers your games from the major chess playing sites to give you actionable insights and even quiz you on tactics that you may have missed during your game. So please go to aimchess.com and check out the product. And if you do decide to subscribe, use the promo code perpetual30 to get a discount on aimchess.com. And we are back and we're going to dive right into another question from a Patreon supporter of the podcast. This one is from Martin Walk. Thanks for the support, Martin. And Martin, his first question, um, I think I think Paul has answered, which is uh, for Paul, how, where do you find enjoyment in chess if your rating is staying about the same? I think he's covered that in full. And then he also asked for Paul and Han, at what point would somebody decide to transition from sustainment mode, meaning, you know, you're you're just you're admitting or approaching things such that you just want to keep your level and you're not really trying to get better to improver mode or back? 
So Han, since you've got a lot of experience working with adults, maybe you could uh, could tackle that one. And Paul, welcome to chime in as well. So I think it's like a personal decision and you have to decide what you want to get out of chess. So if you are, like I mentioned, like a senior who likes to play in a library uh, with other seniors who likes to trash talk and likes the chess landscape, as, uh, as Paul described, that's perfectly fine. At the same time, um, I'm, I'm uh, at the moment, I'm, uh, I'm coaching uh, an adult improver who just started and who is 49 and he is a medical doctor and he is disciplined and determined. And uh, I'm sure that he, uh, he reached now 1600 in a few months. Wow. I'm sure that he will go uh, above 1800. I just want to say uh, also, um, I, 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 I think it's really your choice, right? I think also if you look at the time period that we are in, with COVID, with the war in the Ukraine, with climate change, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of people with mental health issues. I think, I think you should also be able to say, I make a choice that chess for me should just be fun. It's not for improvement. I just like to, I just like to, to engage in this activity. I like to be part of a community. I like to, this is my, uh, this is kind of self-care. And this is not about my rating improvement. So I think especially in this time, um, there should not be judgment about whether you, what, the, what, the, what, what you get out of chess or what you're, I think it's, uh, I think uh, you, it's a personal choice. But I, I believe that uh, whether you're 50 or 55, there's still room to improve. It's different when you're a grandmaster and, and someone you would come to me and say, I'm 2,500, I'm over 50, I want to get to 2,700. That's a different issue. But when you are a club player and you're 50, you're determined and you're disciplined, I, there, you, you can improve. I'm sure about that. But it is a choice. And it's not a bad choice if you, if you choose for it to be a fun activity. Beautifully said, Han. Yeah, I, I agree. Anything to add, Paul? Uh I think uh, Han uh, nailed it. I think uh, maybe the only thing I'd add is from the the uh, sustainer perspective is uh, I I could see getting back into um, into uh, tournament play uh, if I could find a way to disconnect my uh, my uh, ego from the the whole rating thing, right? And that would I'd love to hear how how people are are doing that. Like I see people who, you know, uh, some of the folks in uh, the Albuquerque area, you know, who have uh, peaked, you know, years ago and now are really just uh, their ratings are going down, down o uh, older people. But if they can, if they're finding something in the tournament experience, right. Um, or uh, uh, preparing for tournaments and uh, doing the, uh, you know, the, the uh, following study plans and stuff that would kind of like, uh, just balance out the whole the the rating uh, concern with rating points. I think it would uh, that would that would be enough to shift over if that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's very hard. I mean, I struggle with it even just in online play, but obviously to a much greater extent when when you play tournament chess. I mean, it's really the only, it's like your report card, you know, or at least it's natural to think of it that way. So it's hard it's hard to to disentangle oneself from sort of. Uh, uh, identifying as your rating, but I certainly advocate not doing so, but just conceding that it's a challenge. Um, so we had another listener comment from another person who really identified with the story you told, Paul. And I, uh, you know, I had shared some of what you'd written with uh, Patreon subs. And, and again, this is one I think you've already touched on, but it was from Jack Russell who mentioned, he said, um, do you pr do you prioritize studying things that you think are fun and would be, would be fun to learn, regardless of if they help if they help you improve or not? I think that we can call that a yes, right? <laughs> I'd say, uh, it's yes and no. Um, like I said earlier, the uh, I, I can't say that going through all these positions from uh, from the the um, 
uh, from the comprehensive chess course are particularly fun, right? Uh, and it feels repetitive, but that's what I'm trying to do. But going through Bent Larson's games is very fun, right? That's, uh, that's, that's very much fun. Um, so some of it I think is just, uh, is just work, necessary work. It's like, uh, well, it's like, uh, like, trying to remember how to speak a language right and and the the more you hear it the 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 more fluent you get um and the, so going through those positions uh every morning that i've been doing that's just you know that's like just practicing my 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 chess language yeah like your scales yeah, yeah. um but but why do that at all? If if you're just in it for the enjoyment at this stage, like why not just be like a hundred percent? I'm going to review the master games that I enjoy because I really don't uh, enjoy playing chess when I do very badly. That's the thing. Okay. Uh, it's uh, that uh, I, I don't mind losing, right? Like uh, uh, I, I, I I I don't mind losing fair and square, but if I if I I lose because of some something just absolutely like a like hanging a piece right uh, that just drives me crazy and I, I i still do that i do that all the time um uh and if, if uh if i can if i can just stop doing that uh i don't care if i get crushed every game uh, it's fine right as long as i'm uh, as as long as i'm not beating myself so I'm, the reason I'm doing that stuff is to try to avoid beating myself in every game. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a Patreon question that's exactly on that note, uh, because he, he mentioned that what you wrote about how your current, how your updated goal is, quote, to lose without glaringly obvious blunders. Alex Friedman wrote and said that really resonated with him. And he asked how you feel all the studying is affecting this goal. Like, do you feel like what you're doing is helping? Uh, it's, yeah, that, and that was a good question. Uh, and, but one that's very hard to answer because I don't know if I, if I would be dropping pieces every game if I wasn't doing this, right? Uh, I'd like to think so. I still am dropping pieces. Uh, um, if, uh, if, if, if I, if I, uh, not every game, I've had some fantastic games over the last, you know, three months. I mean, some, some games that I'm actually proud of. Uh, but still, I'll, you know, I can count on once a week playing a game where I just, you know, drop a bishop uh, just for no reason. Uh, if I, I tell you what, if I was, if I was, if I played every game without dropping a, a minor piece, my, my inner Ben Johnson would start telling me, okay, go to a tournament, <laughs> go play in a tournament. <laughs> That's all my yes, it would now. even have your voice, Ben. It would. <laughs> now, now, Han, let me ask you. I'm sure you get asked by some of your students. I mean, we all want to mitigate our blunders. Um, so what advice would you give, like following up on Alex's question from what is your typical advice, Han, to, uh, to limit blunders and at the dropping pieces level especially? Yes. So when you look to the chess steps method, uh, what you try to do is separate the orientation on the position and then afterwards the, the, the calculation and the visualization. And what I notice is that if people take more time for the orientation, and of course we know the obvious things to look at, unprotected pieces, checks, threats, right? Those are the obvious ones. And you look at them while you, you select your move and you visualize when you're about to make your move, what will be the new position. Um, but what I notice is if you can separate this orientation from the calculation and not mix them together, that you see a lot more and that your blunders will, uh, will, will be less. So yeah. the orientation being like looking at the map and the the calculation being like the directions? So orientation, right? So in the step methods, you have, of course, the technical side. And I mentioned the, the, the obvious ones, which is unprotected pieces, um, the, the checks on the king, uh, the threats I was mentioning. But of course, there are other elements like uh, two pieces uh, which are on one line. Um, you can have... And that's one thing that has really struck uh, struck me over the last two years: pieces which have a central defending task. It uh, that they are as bad a defender as as a pinned piece, 
So you look at your position and say, which pieces have a central defending task? So there is, you have your checklist of all the elements that you have to look at, uh, pieces which don't have a lot of squares to go to that might potentially get trapped and are not uh, on pre at the moment. So, so there is this, this list uh, that I also shared in my presentation. Um, and that's what you look at. And, and when you are complete in that, uh, I noticed that, first of all, you see a lot more combinations that are in the position, but also you will start uh, s stopping to overlook uh, um, dropping pieces or falling for easy tactics. Okay. And Han, we should, a lot of listeners, I think, will have heard the steps method come up uh, yeah. on the podcast, especially if they've heard our prior interview. But could you give a, a brief description of what it is for anyone who, who has not heard it discussed uh, previously? So it's a Dutch curriculum, um, and it brings you from novice to master level. It is six uh, manuals with scripted lessons, 27 workbooks. And then the workbooks are typically about 50 pages and 12 exercises on each page. And um, so in total, it's about 14,000 exercises. And um, it was the method for uh, the Dutch Chess Federation, and it has gained popularity in the States, but also in Germany and in other European countries, uh, and but also in countries like Turkey. And um, so it has become very popular across the world. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's, uh, it, it brings you from novice to master level, and it includes all elements of the game. Yeah, and it's a great curriculum. Um, we'll have more on it later. Uh, we're actually going to take another break, and then we've got a few more questions to, from listeners to dig into. New courses from our friends at Chessable.com include Adi Bond's E4, a lifetime repertoire from the entertaining Indian Grandmaster. Speaking of entertaining, I am Andres Toth has an E4 for beginners course out that I think is a great choice if you're newer to chess and looking to tighten up your opening repertoire with white. Uh, Grandmaster Simon Williams, the Ginger GM, is out with a video version of the classic book, The Life and Games of Mikhail Tal. That's coming in April. So there's lots of good stuff. And of course, whatever you get from Chessable, it includes their proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to make sure you remember the patterns that you learn. So be sure to go to chessable.com and check out their full library of courses that are available both for free and for purchase. And we are back and we're going to get to our next listener question, which is from Ed Daly. And it is for all three of us, he says. So his question is, do you think you need to have some level of improvement in order to just sustain your current level? He's 60 years old, didn't start playing until his late 30s, hit his peak rating about 10 years ago, and now is almost 250 points below his peak. It may be wishful thinking, but I think I'm a better player today than I was 10 years ago. But I also think the level of competition, the tools available, the boom in chess interest, et cetera, requires continued improvement just to keep pace. Interested in your views. Now, Han, you and I have talked about this uh, offline, so maybe I'll let you take this first. <laughs> yeah, I think there's definitely um, some rating deflation going on. And I mean, you just have to picture like a 10-year-old child, girl or boy, who, who comes to the, to the chess tournament and who has... Uh, uh, mastered uh, uh, 12 uh, chess openings on Chessable, who has uh, done all the tactics and has a 2700 tactics rating on chess.com or lead chess, and, and who has, a, let's say, a blitz rating or a rapid rating online from 2400, and who comes in there and he says, I'm a 1600, right? And then, <laughs> so I think, I, think, I think that's kind of the picture that... There are, so, there are indeed a lot of tools, and I think for uh, youth players, uh, this, this whole gaming effect that you that you study on Chessable, you memorize your openings, you know exactly uh, the lines, and so they're well prepared, they're tactically sharp, um, and I even see it reflected in the step method that you have positional aspects, aspects like vulnerability and activity. They're still much more difficult, but when you go to typical uh, tactical elements like double attack and things like that, people are so much stronger at the moment and you can take them to steps higher because they are mastering that through different means. Yeah. 
And and I've talked about this before, so I won't say too much, but I'll just say I, I agree with Han. Um, you know, when I interviewed James Altucher, he's someone who was also USCF master who spent 20 years away from chess and came back and mentioned he definitely felt like players were stronger. And I know he's come back and lost a bit of rating since then, even though he's working really hard on his chess. So uh, I think it's pretty unequivocal. Ed, that, and I don't know what happens at the top, but basically just, you know, human knowledge about chess is expanding quite quickly. So uh, the rating system is not necessarily designed for that that level of change. And as I talked about um, in... Uh, my interview with Mark Glickman, a rating system that adapted to more recent results might help with that. But anyway, Ed, we definitely feel your pain. And Paul, since you're not playing rated tournaments, you may not experience it as much. But what do you see in terms of working with the kids at the chess club? Um, are they making use of these new tools? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, these kids, uh, I, this seemed shocking to me, but uh, apparently this is normal. Uh, some of these kids had never played on a, what I consider a real board uh, right, b- yeah. before August. Uh, they, of course, they've spent, uh, they've spent the last, uh, you know, the better part of a year in, in lockdown. And, um, and so, First, then the school had no chess boards at all. So first thing I did was got, get, I got some real chess boards in there and it was a new experience for them. They were, they play on, on chess.com all the time. Uh, and they, they, they love talking about their, uh, the, the kids who are really serious, love talking about their, their chess.com ratings and they're really, they're really into it. So it's, it, it, it's, uh, especially, um, say, as the pandemic was winding down out here, uh, a lot of kids were on chess.com. I think it's it's tapered off some, but uh, it, they're they're still they're still there. They're still using this stuff. And Paul, it's funny that you mentioned chess.com because it is time for our sponsored segment, the chess.bomb. For listeners who have not heard this, on 2022 Adult Improver episodes, we are highlighting a particular feature that we like of chess.com. And in this case, I had asked Paul if there were any features that he particularly enjoyed. And he mentioned the chess.com Explorer, which which is basically a big online database, which features an opening explorer. I think a lot of listeners will be familiar with your ability to sort of play through a handful of moves and then like see which moves are the most popular. It's a great way to just figure out what openings pique your interest. And then that that sort of feeds into the master's database, which, Paul, I understand that that's that's the feature that you enjoy from chess.com most. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. And and it's uh, because of my interest in uh, in these older games. Um, I, I like uh, looking at uh, particularly in the uh, in the openings. I can look at how the openings were played in 1966 and then sort of trace the DNA of the, the opening back in time and forward in time very easily using uh, using that interface and uh, I can also go through the games with the with the engine going and uh, and learn a lot that way um, I also like uh, taking these master games and um, going to the point where the where one of the masters resigned and trying to trying to play through against the computer uh, uh, as the from the winning side to see if I can actually win it and uh, that database makes that very possible too so it, it all kinds of different uh, aspects of the game uh, uh, you can use uh, the the masters database for yeah and what you mentioned playing out resigned positions is a good training tool um, and also in the master's database those of you who heard my interview with grandmaster johan helston he was talking about how you know you can pick a certain role model and a certain opening and the master's database is great for that like if you want to look at like nakamura or kasparov's king's indian games uh you can just search for that and they also have an archive where you can use the explorer to to sort of cycle through your own games and all of this stuff of course you can copy and paste the games and put them in your own personal library which even if you're a free chess.com member you can store i think it's up to like a thousand games and then it's even more than that if you are a diamond member which by the way if you do choose to upgrade your membership to take advantage of all of uh, chess.com's premium features be sure to use the link in the description there we go again um, in order to um, help support perpetual chess uh, so I believe that that concludes our chess.bomb. 
And we've got a couple more questions to get to. As we mentioned, we did have some questions from Han for uh, relating to the steps method. So Paul, feel free to hop in because I, I know we were talking before we recorded and that you didn't you didn't have much familiarity with the steps method. So, you know, if a question occurs to you, there's a good chance people listening who aren't familiar with it may have the same question. Okay. So um, welcome your perspective while you're here. Uh, and this question is from Mark Miller. Um, I know that Mark has taken a liking, as as Han mentioned, a lot of people here in the U.S. have to the STEP method. And and Paul, I mean, since you run a chess program, uh, run an after-school club, you may want to look into it as well. It's a good way to sort of tons of lessons in it and lots of puzzles to give kids and so on. Anyway, Mark's question is, for those teachers and players who are fans of the STEPS method, there doesn't seem to be an easy way to gain certification in the method, nor much of a push to increase opportunities for doing so in the U.S. This is to gain teacher certification. Has Han ever taught instructors in this method? If not, would he be willing to? And what is his thinking about greater adoption in the U.S. or even federation approval? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mark. Um, so uh, we had a previous guest on the Perpetual Chess Podcast, uh, Job de Lamar, and he is uh, he was someone who was giving out certifications. Um, I work with Cor van Weigerde, and he is not really interested to set up an international program. Um, and personally, I prefer to work on a one-on-one -on -one basis with my students and, and not to get into the organizing business of uh, certifications. Um, I do think um, your suggestion that um, the Federation should look to in, into this, I, I support that. Um, I think if you look to the U.S. Chess Federation, they should provide uh, more infrastructure for scholastic chess and, and also for trainers in general. And I think um, when you look in overall to the U.S. Chess Federation, there are a lot of functions that they do that you also see covered by chess.com and, and other uh, chess, uh, chess 24 in terms of uh, news and, and things like that. And I, w I think it would be good if they focus more on providing an infrastructure for U.S. Chess. Yeah. That being said, um, I gave in 2019 a presentation on the chess steps method. Uh, for the U.S. Chess Federation on the, in, uh, on the nationals. Um, I'm two years further down the road, learned a lot by teaching. And um, I am going to give this presentation on YouTube. So that will be on Saturday, April 16th. It will be in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I invite everyone to be there. It, it will not be a typical 10 to 15 minutes. It will be like two hours. So if you have any questions uh, about the steps methods and the contents, um, I hope you are there. It will be a live presentation on YouTube, and I will take any questions, and I expect it to be one to two hours. Okay. Sounds like a great opportunity. And, yeah, just, just to echo what – what Han said. I know, I think Mark, um, there's, there's definitely a frustration. I've certainly gotten some emails, you know, over the years, uh, having talked about the steps method on the program. And as you said, having interviewed you up about it, um, there, there is a frustration that, that core, who of course is the co-creator of the steps method and the only living of the co-creators, he's just not that interested in, in expanding it. And I don't know, um, I don't know if that's I don't know if there's if that's going to change. But as Han said, on the U.S. side, um, you know, John Hartman, obviously friend of the pod, uh, Chess Life magazine editor, is a huge fan of uh, the Chess Steps method. So I, I have no inside information, but certainly um, I, I, like Han, would hope that maybe the U.S. Chess Federation from their side could do a little more to like formally implement things, but there's certainly there's not going to be like official Dutch certification uh, forthcoming, unfortunately. Um, yes, go ahead, Paul. Uh, I have a question for for Han about the the chess steps method. I feel as uh, like I should represent the the older sustainer slash improver crowd. Um, how how would you recommend approaching the program as uh, uh, say an an older player 
where you've sort of reached a, reached a certain level uh, in your chest strength and you're looking to improve, looking to get better or looking to stay the same. Uh, where, how would you, uh, what would you recommend to an adult uh, as far as approaching this program? Who's been around the block? It depends on your ambition. So um, if I look to myself, I've never had a coach in my whole life. And uh, you can, of course, use the manuals and do the exercises and train by yourself. But one of the things of the STEP method is that you learn to see. So when I am having students, I'm constantly asking them questions. So I'm not giving, it's not like instruction that I'm telling them. No, I ask them questions. And over time, they start to see. And that, that's the only thing that's, of course, difficult if you read manuals and you have to kind of change yourself that's uh, that's uh, that's a, a bigger barrier but it depends on your ambition like i said i had i never had a coach i did it myself and it's possible um but if you have a, a trainer who is uh, knows the step method really well and he is using the socratic method then it can accelerate your learning i believe do i did i answer your question yeah i think i, I think so yeah uh, okay. yeah Excellent. And we have one more uh, steps method related question. This one is from Wayne Inkpen. Um, thanks for supporting Perpetual Chess, Wayne. And Wayne asks, he says, what chess books make excellent complements to the steps series? As I understand it, it does not include information about openings. I suspect general opening books as opposed to specific opening books, he's implying might be helpful. I also wonder about any complementary material other than these that might be the most useful Maybe Han can tell us what complements the step course, what to complement the step course with, and at what levels he brings them into the course. At what level do you introduce supplements to the course? Uh, yes. So I'd like to answer this in a, a bit broader way than specifically related to books. I, I would like to answer this. What kind of tools do I use outside the, the step method for my students and, and, and in a broader sense? So... The first thing is about, let's start with the opening side. Um, in, in the step method, of course, you have uh, the golden rules of the opening, develop your pieces, um, king safety, uh, pawn, uh, control the center, and then related to that, the, the metaphor that your pieces are an army and that you have to deploy them so efficiently at, at, as possible and have good cooperation. And that if you do that, you're the first to attack. So that's the kind of the basis. Then the second part is that in the step method, it basically it says you learn your openings by playing games because playing games and evaluating your games is an essential part of the step method. That being said, what I do is I have a specific method to go about chess openings. I create my own mini books. Uh, so I use the Lee Chess uh, database. It's like, uh, they, I think probably they have about 4 billion games at the moment. And I use the classical games of club players and the rapid uh, games of them. So the serious games, you could say, reasonably serious games. And I, I, I select a number of lines of the opening that my student wants to learn. So normally it's like 15, 20 lines. That's it. So you get a playable position, uh, uh, like say an exciting, fun position with imbalances. And... I upload that to Chessable and they, they learn it there within a spaced repetition. So that's what the, on the opening side. So the Leeches database, select the, on the strength of the club player and take it from there and then upload it to Chessable and do your spaced repetition. What I noticed a lot of players have difficulty with is I get my out of the opening, but what do I do next? What are my goals uh, for that? I, uh, I use the book on Chessable from... Uh, Chess structures from Marcia Flores. So he describes basically when you have a pawn structure and the pawn structure is related to the opening, what kind of plans go with it. So that's an, a, a book in addition to the step method that I use, chess structures from Marcia Flores, uh, looking at um, plans after the opening. Second to that is looking at games between uh, strong masters and amateurs and deriving from that the typical plans that go with the opening. A lot of players have difficulty after the opening to find a plan. So look at 
how a strong player beats a weak player, relatively weak player, and what plan they um, they 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 use. So that is the opening part. Then when it comes to playing, of course, like I just mentioned, playing games is a crucial element. Um, many of my students are playing the Lee Chess 45, 45 League. Shout out to Lee Chess, Lila, Chess Zero, Stockfish, and also the Lee Chess 45, 45 League. Great communities who create great services all for free. Um, and in the Lee Chess 45, 45 League, um, th this is a let's say an environment where the student can prepare for the game because they know their opponent and they can look up what kind of openings they play. So you learn in context. And then after that, a lot of players have difficulty with calculation. So they're playing ping pong chess, like Herman Grote uh, calls it, or hope chess, like uh, Heisman calls it. Yeah, yeah. so the, yeah. You, you know the terms. Oh, yeah. But so what I ask my students to do is when they are playing a game in the Lee Chess 45, 45 League, is to share their calculations. So I don't want general considerations, no orientation. I want, waving, as Heisman calls it. <laughs> I, just, I just want from them candidate moves and variations. And, and so that's a, that's a way for them to practice calculation and, and to show um, and, 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 and to learn to go away from hope chess, but get into the discipline of really calculation during the game. And it's, it's of course, great to see afterwards because you can, uh, in the spectator room, you can whisper your calculations, right? So you do it during the game. And afterwards, you can compare notes and say, what were you thinking? So you see the thinking process of your student and, and you can see actually what someone missed. So I think that's a, that's a, a nice addition to the step method also in the COVID time to play games, but also to learn from them. Uh, and it's a unique feature of the Lee Chess 45, 45 League. All right. Well, that was a much better version of the answer I was going to give, Han, but which, was just, <laughs> which, which was just chess is not just a, a collection of puzzles. You know, every, it's every game tells its own story and you don't want to lose true. sight of that when you're doing puzzles. You want to both focus on that in your own games. And, and as you say, as you both have said, learn to appreciate it from, from reviewing the games of others uh, in some cases, masters, but it doesn't even have to be like learning from the legends necessarily. Uh, Han, how far into these opening lines do you, do you have your students go out of curiosity? These, these lines you pull from Lee, Lee chess, um, uh, how, how deep into the opening do they go? That depends, of course, a bit on how forced they are. Okay. Right? So, um, I mean, it becomes a bit technical now, but I make like a, I, 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 I kind of make a, a tree, and I, I note in the tree how many games have been played with a certain move. And I go to a certain depth until I have a certain coverage. So I'd like to be, let's say, at eighty percent, and uh, get get all everything covered. But so if I look to myself, right? I also created them for myself. Uh, like the Dubov Explosive Italian is the result of a Lee Chess forty five forty five game, um, and uh, for me, it's a great way to learn and to uh, and, and and it's also a form of active learning. Um, but I created, let's say, a Grunfeld course, which is uh, about 50 lines, and a Dragon course, which is about 50 lines. And I think that's sufficient. So I, it, my objective is not to give my students a crushing advantage after the opening because they memorized everything better. No, I want them to have interesting positions and solid foundation in their openings and understand the plans when they get out of the opening. Cool. You got some ideas for your chess clubs now, Paul? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe for me. <laughs> you will hear now multiple voices in your exactly, head, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah. I got an inner Han in here too. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Paul, I I think we've covered most of the topics, but I did want to sort of you know. As you you mentioned, and as many of us have had, we we all have seasons in our in our lives when it comes to chess. We have periods of intense interest, and then often, you know, we might set it aside as as life circumstances intervene. 
So do you think, Paul, that you'll stick around the chess world this time? Uh, it. Uh, it really depends uh, on the on the people. If I can if I can maintain uh, a, a community yeah, the, of of people who are interested in chess um, outside of work. Uh, if uh, if uh, if I can if if these uh, these guys I've been playing with can t- uh, continue to maintain their club. If my my good friend in Albuquerque c- maintains his chess interest, I can I can certainly see it happening. Uh, it's it's really the the, the people. For me, are the are are the motivating thing, the the thing that that keep me coming back uh, for more. So it's uh, it's it, it's very possible. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I hope so, and that's you know that's nice to hear. It's sort of life affirming in a way. Now you've got this sort of secret interest in chess history too. So when you get together with uh with your fellow chess enthusiasts who maybe do not maybe they're not opposed to learning chess history but they maybe don't pursue it to the degree that you do do you tell them do you start telling them stories about the pia korski <laughs> cup, cup and stuff no, no i've i've <laughs> i spent too much time around high school students uh over the over the last uh you know 25 years to to to, to tell a lot of stories so i'll just uh you know i'll, I'll save it for uh for the the right company Excellent. Well, I've got one more question for Paul, but before I ask that, Han, do you have any more questions for Paul or anything else to to say? No, I just want to react on one thing that you mentioned, like that you feel that um, your chess is related to your ego, right? Right. Rating. The rating is yeah. yeah. Rating is yeah. yes, and I, I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I think one of the things we have to do is also learn how to separate that. Right. You cannot. Take rating with you in your grave, and uh, we better make it's it's such a nice, nice uh, uh, game to play. And um, so, so I have also students, and it's like what I tell them is throw your ego out of the window, right? Just leave because it's even a distraction. So just leave go, leave it. Throw your ego out of the window and just enjoy the game. And it's very hard, right? It's very hard, but that's. I think it's it, that that helps for a lot of people to improve with their resilience. If you can throw your ego out of the window and, and say, "I'm not, I'm not defined by my rating. Um, I like this too much. I like this game too much, and I like the, the company too much." Um, yeah, I think that's fine advice. Very fine advice. Yeah. 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 And for me, in this case, you know, I, I blame my children, obviously, for anything that goes wrong in my life. But um, <laughs> one thing that helps when I play chess is if I'm in a tense moment or I'm worried I'm going to screw thing something up in a, in a tournament game or I do sc- screw something up, you know, I can just think of my my six year old daughter who couldn't care less, couldn't, you know, wouldn't know the first thing about like, even whether I won or lost a game, let alone about my rating. And there's just so many things in life that that you can focus on that, um, that are way more important and that, you know, just make any number next to your name, just pale in comparison. But, but it is, it is an ongoing struggle. You do need to remind yourself it's, it doesn't happen naturally. That's a very good point. And I, I'm not really sure how many of us would really enjoy chess as much if we were playing like say Carlson and Nepo were in that, in that last match. It's just, it, 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 it almost seems joyless in a way, right? When it, well, Car- Carlson seems to think yes. so. he, doesn't to do, <laughs> right. he doesn't want to do it again. Yeah, he'd rather so. play basketball, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, um, I want to thank you, you both. Um, this has been excellent. Um, yeah. Han, thank you for your contributions. I, I knew that you would be, you would add a lot to this conversation and you did not disappoint. Um, so Han, uh, listeners who listen in time should definitely check out your lecture again, link in the show notes. What else should we link in the show notes, Han? Um, yeah, of course. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, I'm a chessable author. So, um, uh, and, and, and my courses are de- designed for club players. And I, 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 there's a lot of positive response because they are not long-term or lifetime repertoires. Uh, no, they're, they're small and, and, and fun to play. Inexpensive, I might add as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and Paul, do you have any, I mean, this has been great. It's been great to hear your perspective. It was overdue to hear someone with a sort of more measured ex perspective, an amateur with a measured perspective to improvement. Do you have any parting advice to our uh, adult improver listeners, Paul? Oh, I would say uh, well, to other fellow adult improvers, I guess. Just, or senior sustainers. Or senior sustainers. Well. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say just get out there and play. I think that uh, there, um, the, the, the pandemic had a uh, uh, had a real detrimental effect on uh, on face to face play, and uh, we can't we can't let it go away. It's it's too important, uh, too important a thing for for all the wonders of chess.com and Lee Chess and all these chess platforms. The, they're great, but but get out there, get in, get sit down at a board with a with a, a real human being and see you know know the, learn their name, see their face, and 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 play a game. That's the that's my advice. That is excellent advice. And just before we say goodbye, listeners, I wanted to give a shout out to recent Perpetual Chess Patreon subs. And I also wanted to mention that Perpetual Chess has finally launched a Discord. We're starting small right now. It's only for the Rook tier, which is those who donate $10 a month to Perpetual Chess. But we may expand as time goes on. But anyway, I wanted to thank recent uh, Perpetual Chess subs, Jim Papadakis, John Fallon, Matt, Matthew du De Rue, I apologize, Matthew. Uh, Morgan Francis, Justin Bapti, Joel Fulton, Joel Weiner, and Steve Wu, which is not his real name, but uh, I was excited to say Steve Wu, so whatever. Um, so thanks again to Paul and Han, and thanks to everyone who is list for listening, and we will catch you all next week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode. <laughs>